Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Cheryl Reynolds. I'm with the UC IPM program, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today is the UC Ag Expert Talk on Asian Citrus Psyllid for Commercial Growers and PCAs. Peter Casina will be running our polls and troubleshooting any of our um, technical problems. So at this point, I would like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Brett Beth Crafton Cardwell is a citrus IPM specialist and research entomologist at the Lynn Cove Research and Extension Center. And today she'll be speaking on Asian citrus psyllid for commercial growers and PCAs. So at this time, Beth, you can um, share your slides. Great. There we go. Can you see them okay, Cheryl? Yes, I can see them. Great. Okay, today I'm going to talk to you about the latest strategies for managing Asian citrus psyllid in your groves. Many of you have already heard me speak many times, so some of the basics I'm going to go through very quickly and try and get into some of the more of the strategies. For those uh, who are new to this subject, Huang Lung Bing disease is now here in California. It's a bacterial disease. When it hits trees, at first it's the roots that are affected, and so that causes the leaves to become yellow, foliage becomes thin, fruit drops off easily, the fruit gradually becomes smaller and smaller, and the juice becomes bitter. And eventually there's tree death because we have no cure for the disease at this point. How long does it take for this process to happen? Varies, depends on the tree, depends on the region. Um, trees can go down very quickly, like in five years, or it can take longer. So one of our main questions is why is this disease quickly spreading and why is it so hard to detect? I show this slide over and over again because to me it's the basics of the biology of the system. The eggs are laid on new flush next to where the psyllid injects the bacterium. So it's laying down a little localized pool of bacteria. When those eggs hatch and the nymphs start feeding on it, they're taking the bacterium into their bodies because they're sitting on it for four to six weeks. They molt a few times and then they become adults and they fly away and that bacteria is in their bodies. So the nymphs are key for the transmission of this disease. And when, this, the leaves are sampled on that tree, they have to have the bacteria in them for PCR, polymerase chain reaction, the biochemical test that the regulators use. It, the bacteria has to be in the leaf in order to detect it. So if you walk up to a tree and the bacteria is in a localized one branch on one side and you're on the other side, you might miss it completely. It takes nine months to several years for the bacteria to spread through the tree either by psyllids or by moving through the tree for sampling to get the right leaf. And so we're always behind the eight ball in terms of finding this disease. And that's, that's a very big frustration. And so our best way to manage the disease is to keep the psyllid populations as low as possible so they're not doing that spreading. So what's happening currently? Um, we have these blue lines which show where the quarantines are. Basically, HLB is gradually increasing. Not as fast as we had expected. We were kind of expected even more trees at this point, but um, it started in 2012 with just two trees. Things were quiet for a couple of years. 2017, it started to take off. Uh, 2018, we had 593 trees. And this year to date, we have about 700 trees. So it's it's increasing. Where is it increasing? In Southern California inside those red rings. Uh, it now includes Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and recently San Bernardino County. They've, they had a find in a tree. So all of these have been residential trees. They've all been removed. Um, and CDFA is working very hard to sample around all of these infections and see if they can find any additional infections. And when they do, they remove the trees. Uh, they're treating the fine sites and the neighbors. And so lots is happening in Southern California. But because of the problem of not being able to perfectly find every infected tree, the disease is continuing to spread. This is just a close-up shot of where the HLB infections are. You can see this on, uh, on my website. And the reddish squares are where they found infected trees. The bluish squares are where they have only found infected psyllids. And so you can see that, that 
there's a big group in Orange County. So what's the California situation in terms of the psyllid? That was the disease. Now let's talk for a minute about the psyllid. In Central and Northern California, the populations have been incredibly low, especially this last year. This little table here shows you the number of uh, traps that have had psyllids since 2016. So in the Central Valley, there were lots, 351 total in 2016. In 2017, there were fewer, in 2018, fewer, and in 2019, only four so far. So what's going on here? Well, it's a combination of things, but before I explain that, I just want to point out that the little black numbers within the counties in the central and north area show you how many this year, how many traps have had psyllids. So there's a cluster in the San Jose area of 72, but everywhere else it's just one or two here and there. So the populations have been really low and they've been low statewide this year. So I think it's a combination of two factors and I'll say this again and again throughout my talk. It's a combination of climate and pesticides. Climate, um, anytime there is anything that causes the flush to harden off, that's a good thing for us because the psyllid can only lay its eggs on very soft flush and the nymphs can only feed on soft flush. So you stop the population if the flush hardens off. So extremes of heat, extremes of cold, take care of that. They harden the flush. So that's where your climate comes in. And the San Joaquin Valley in general has a more extreme climate than S Southern California, especially along the coast. The other thing is pesticides. Um, and I'll show this in a minute. Pesticide activity in the San Joaquin Valley is just plain and simply higher than it is in Southern California. And a lot of the insecticides that are used are psyllid effective. And so that helps keep populations reduced. So those two factors are, have really calmed things down. Most of the fines in 2016 and 17 were in the Bakersfield area. Um, so we'll come back to that. In Southern California, the psyllid is basically everywhere. Um, it's struggling to survive in the desert, but when things first started, they could find plenty of them in the desert. Uh, and it has pretty well spread itself everywhere. So in that region, uh, in the, well, let me take a step back. In Central and Northern California, the approach is eradication. You find a psyllid on a trap, you search the area, you spray the area. and the chemicals that are used are pyrethroids and neonics primarily, and those work great to locally eradicate the pest. In Southern California, local eradication is not feasible. So growers are on an area-wide suppression program, and in the urban areas, parasites have been released uh, to try and calm the populations down. And those, both of those things are helping. It's not as um, pristine as it is in, in the San Joaquin Valley, but it, they're definitely helping. So I'm going to go into talking about what's going on in these two different regions because a lot of different things are happening. So this is just a picture of the insecticide treatments, the types that go on in the San Joaquin Valley. There are thrips and katydids and citricola scale or red scale and fuller rose beetle treatments for export fruit. And all the chemicals in red are psyllid effective. And so there's lots of that going on for various reasons and that helps keep the orchards in the San Joaquin Valley fairly clean. In addition to that, um, in Kern County, in the Southern Blue highlighted area, psyllids have popped up over and over again in the last four years. And so those growers in that region have got, gotten into a routine because of recommendations by the San Joaquin Valley ACP task force uh, to treat together in an area-wide sense. And when I say area-wide, I mean all the growers try and treat within a couple of weeks of each other in order to get a bigger effect. And they've been doing that uh, spring and sometimes fall as well. And that has really helped to calm things down in that, in that southern San Joaquin Valley area. So in addition to CDFA treating Bakersfield, uh, the growers are staying on top of treating southern San Joaquin Valley. What about biological control? I get asked all this time, why can't we just depend on natural enemies? Uh, this little parasitic wasp, Tamarixia, that lays its egg under the nymphs and bores in and feeds on them and kills them. Why can't we just, just rely on those? 
Well, just like every biological control situation, the pests increase, then the biological control kicks in and starts to bring the pest populations down. When you have a disease situation, you can't afford to allow those pest populations to do that increase. And the right now, the Tamarixia are extremely expensive. They're like 50 cents a piece. And so it, you, you can't buy enough, release enough to equal an insecticide treatment in terms of managing the the pest. And so in Southern California, they've been released throughout Southern California and they're established there. And then additional releases are constantly being made in areas where uh, HLB has popped up. And so you can see there's a concentration of green dots where in the center of Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, those areas, and along the border with Mexico. So Tamarixia are still being produced. They're, the growers are supporting that. They're still being released. Um, but the focus is really in the residential areas, not the commercial citrus areas. So what do commercial citrus growers do? They treat with insecticides. Uh, there are lots and lots of insecticides that will kill a psyllid, but some of them kill better than others for two reasons. They, they're plain and simple more toxic um, and or they, the residual life of them is, is different. So organics in particular tend to have a very short life because they're botanicals, they're not synthetic and they break down quickly. And so they tend to last one or two weeks at the most. Whereas synthetic insecticides, especially the pyrethroids and the neonicotinoids last a very long period of time, uh, more than a month. And so if you're trying to eradicate, the emphasis is the pyrethroids and neonics. If you're trying to control, ultimately, those are also the best chemicals. But in the meantime, if you're spraying for other pests, you can see that there are plenty of other chemicals that you can choose that are going to help in the fight against Asian citrus psyllid. Some just work better, last longer than others. So I've had this project for the last three years where I have had scouts in different regions of the state who have been sampling 40 to 50 orchards each and surveying and understanding what's happening with the psyllids whenever a grower applies a treatment. So this is all about commercial grower treatments. And what, we're, what we've observed in just general is that in the desert, uh, Coachella and Imperial Valleys, the psyllid pressure is extremely low. It's there, it, or it was there, but in the commercial citrus, it's very, very low. And those growers have banded together in pest control districts and they treat twice a year. They do a winter treatment and a fall treatment. And my scout there has not been able to find any psyllids whatsoever for the last two years. So that tells me that the, that the environment plus the treatments are very effective in that region. He can find psyllids in residential areas in the spring. So that tells me the psyllids are there. It's just they're not abundant in commercial citrus because of the treatments and the climate. In San Diego, we sort of see sort of a mixed bag and I'll be talking about that some more. They're doing uh, one winter treatment and one to two fall treatments as well. Ventura and Riverside have very high psyllid pressure, partly because Ventura has a lot of lemons, partly because Riverside, San Bernardino, for some reason, I think it's humidity, seems to just have trees that flush more continuously. And so we, a year and a half ago, recommended that they increase the number of treatments in the fall to two in each of those regions. So I want to go through each of the regions and just kind of do a quick chat on each one, just a couple of slides. This is the Temecula San Diego region. I've taken all 41 sites that this person is surveying and averaged. And you see on average, the populations, especially in 2019, have been extremely low and were not terribly high even in the previous years. Um, so the red line is the nymphs per flush, the blue line is the adults per tap sample, and the dotted line is the amount of suitable flush available for them to uh, reproduce on. So that's that's Temecula San Diego. Now I just want to point out that that was the average but every once in a while in in specific three out of the 42 sites 
have noticeable populations of psyllids. In fact, in previous years, they had really high populations. And what's going on there? Well, these growers are choosing not to treat for psyllids. So that tells me that this climate is suitable for psyllids. If, if growers don't treat, they will have psyllids and they might have pretty high populations of psyllids, which is very nerve, nerve wracking for me looking at this. Um, this is a situation where the disease is gonna spread pretty rapidly. Let's look at the Riverside San Bernardino sites. The average in this region is was, especially in 2017, extraordinarily high, like over 10 psyllids per flush. Um, it's come down a bit in the last two years because we, we recommended and the growers, to some extent, instituted two fall treatments. So this is the average over all of the sites. Now I want to show you a couple of examples of sort of good management versus less well-managed populations. Here's this uh, particular site, grapefruits, where the grower um, had some pretty significant populations in 2017, but has been at uh, applying insecticides and in the last year has done really well in terms of there's hardly any uh, nymphs in their orchard. What's going on here? Well, 33 of the 42 Riverside San Bernardino sites have a pattern similar to this. They might have some psyllids this year, but basically they've gotten sort of control over the situation. What have they been doing differently compared to 2017? Um, they've been learning how to use Admire Pro and um, Platinum, and they've been using it fairly early in the season. The first year they used it too late. The second two years they've used it earlier, like May, June, July in that period. And the uptake is good for controlling that fall population of uh, psyllids, and they've done a whole lot better. Now, there are nine out of the 42 San Bernardino Riverside sites where the populations of psyllids are enormous, um, over 10 psyllids per flush. Uh, that's just huge. So you walk down a row and you look at 10 flushes, you're looking at over 100 psyllids. And basically what's happening in these situations, for the most part, is growers are not really responding to the psyllids and they're not really treating. Uh, one in trust treatment a year is nothing. Uh, and trust doesn't work very well, so they have poor choice of chemicals and they're not treating very often and they're allowing the psyllids to grow. So that's happening in some of the sites in the San Bernardino and Riverside area. Now let's look at Ventura. Uh, Ventura the growers definitely have have strategies. Some of them are using broad spectrum pesticides, some relying solely on soft because they want the natural enemies to survive, and some are organic. And what we can see when populations are really high like they were in 2017 is that the organic and the soft chemicals don't hold the population very well. Um, and then in 2018, we recommended two fall treatments and that helped bring all the populations down, but the organics and the soft still kind of struggle and the broad spectrum do the best. And then in 2019, everyone's been doing well because the populations have just been lower. I think, again, it's part climate, you know, weather changes, part the growers have been at this treating for three years now or, or longer, and they're getting control over their psyllid populations. Similar to Riverside, we've got 33 out of the 44 sites have low or virtually non-existent ACP in 2019. Growers are just on it, they're controlling. This region struggles a little bit because you've got lemons and lemons flush almost constantly. So you always have a place for the psyllids to lay eggs. So these growers just really have to stay attentive to the psyllid populations. Um, here's a particular situation where a grower is relying on organic products and they struggle in this region. Uh, the organics are so short-lived that they really need to be applied almost constantly. Um, but 2019 has been better for everybody in the Ventura region. So uh, hats off to Ventura. I, I applaud you. Um, I know you struggle. I know it's hard to get spray rigs out there. Uh, the area-wide treatments are hard to accomplish, but 
a lot of the growers are accomplishing them and I think it's really making a difference. So this year in 2019, uh, the growers, you can see that there's less difference between the treatment regimes. Both the soft and the broad are working pretty well. Organics working pretty well, just not quite as well as, as the broad spectrum chemicals. So when populations are low, most chemicals work. When populations are high, a lot of chemicals don't work. So one of my biggest recommendations is A, don't stop treating, but be on it watch for the population starting to increase, get them while they're low, possibly by doing just perimeter treatments so that they never get big. And I think that will keep the populations more regulated. Scouting for the nymphs is essential. The yellow sticky traps are not very attractive. Tap sampling doesn't reveal very many adults in my experience. So I think examining soft flush and looking for the nymphs is the best way to go. Uh, I would suggest every two weeks, 10 trees on each border and one down the center so you know what's going on in the middles versus the edges. Psyllids like edges. And this is my set of graphs that show that. Uh, these are averages over a bunch of orchards, but it shows in the upper one that uh, the psyllids started on the south edge in August and didn't really get going in the center of the orchard until October. So this grower could have put in a border spray in August to knock the population way down so that uh, it would never get large. Then there are situations in the lower right where the populations are higher, they're high year round, and whole orchard sprays are needed all the time. So if you have low levels of psyllids, they're gonna stay on the borders. You're gonna see the high levels um, when you allow them to build, or if you have a super small block, or you have a very young block, because young blocks, they're not gonna see an edge. They're gonna see a bunch of flush and psyllids are gonna be found throughout. Treat the borders whenever the psyllids start to increase. Don't wait for the area-wide scheduled treatment because they might get really high by the time you're scheduled and you've missed it. So stay on top of the psyllids, keep them low, and I think we'll be in better shape. What other important points do I need to point out? We, I just mentioned young trees. Uh, they're very attractive to psyllids because they're flushing constantly. And these are three things that they're doing in Florida because 100% of their orchards are infected with HLB and they're just trying to get young trees up and surviving the first four years without going down because of HLB. So things that they're doing, are they're putting tree covers over the trees or they're putting reflective mulches down around the base of the trees to distract the psyllids and cause them to not to land. They're using repellent sprays like, uh, I think I'm going to show a picture of that, but the kale and clay, the surround, or the sea light. And they're, they're also, some of the growers are starting to build screen houses and grow citrus under screen because they just can't protect them well enough against the psyllids carrying the HLB. Windbreaks. Um, psyllids like to fly at about the six foot level. So if you can grow a plant or put in a fence that is taller than that, you're gonna create a barrier that is gonna minimize movement of the psyllids between your orchard and the outside. And that's gonna help, it's been shown to help in reducing the psyllids along those edges. Uh, as I mentioned, there are sea light and kale and clay that can act as repellents and could be sprayed on. And eventually we may come up with something like a trap crop for example, uh, Maria that could allow us to um, attract the psyllids away from the citrus. One researcher is working on inserting a BT toxin into Maria with the thought that the psyllids would be attracted away, feed on the Maria, and then be killed by the BT toxin. So all sorts of things are being planned, but at the moment we don't have trap crops. Not every technique is gonna work in every orchard and good efficacy may require stacking these techniques, which means using several of them. So now I wanna move on to the problem that HLB is spreading in Southern California. So what happens when HLB is found in or near a commercial orchard? 
the CDFA and the grower each have a role in responding to that. The CDFA is going to have their mandatory response where they're going to put up um, 400 meter testing and treatment and they're going to throw up a five mile zone that restricts bulk citrus movement and plant movement and require extra mitigations. Uh, what else is going to go on? Well, if you were to have an HLB positive tree in your orchard or very near your orchard, you would be required to, that positive tree would be required to be treated with insecticides within 72 hours and then it would have to be removed and all citrus within 400 meters of the disease would need to be treated within seven days with a foliar if you're one foliar if you're in an area-wide program or several treatments if there's no area-wide treatment has been previously made and then cdfa would collect leaf samples from the perimeter trees in the orchard and the neighboring orchards and test for HLB and establish that five mile quarantine. Now, if they find a positive nymph, but not a tree, they would do all these things except the five mile quarantine. They would not put up a quarantine based on a psyllid, only based on a tree. So one of the things we've been talking about over the last month or so has been what we call the voluntary grower response plan. Uh, and this has been developed to help you know what you should do in addition to what CDFA is going to do or require you to do, uh, to go above and beyond in order to protect your orchard. And some of the things are fairly straightforward and obvious, knowing who your liaison is and being aware of what's going on, you know, being on the citrusinsider.org, uh, scouting for the psyllids, either you or your PCA, uh, in controlling the psyllids with insecticides, young trees and barriers like I've talked about, and visually surveying for HLB and possibly utilizing uh, some organizations to get your trees tested for HLB and maintaining good tree health. Most of these are pretty logical and basic. Um, but I just want to talk about a couple of different scenarios. Some of you are completely outside quarantine zones and fairly far removed from HLB. Some of you might have orchards that are within one to five miles of HLB fines in residential areas. And eventually, possibly in the next year, some of you will be right next door to or have the disease in your orchard. So we have a couple of different scenarios there. One of the things that I developed this, this year was an HLB app for citrus growers. And it's uh, something, this, this webinar is going to be recorded so you can come back to all of these links later and look at them and you can use that QR code to get to the app really quickly. But the reason I put this together is I was getting a lot of questions like uh, from all sorts of people, well where is HLB? And it's a, just a really quick way for you to find out how close you are to HLB. So the way the app works is you can use this on your phone and you can put in an address or you can just touch on the map and it zooms in and it throws up these rings and it tells you how close you are to an HLB find. Uh, the red squares on here are the HLB infected trees that have been removed and the purple squares are the where they have found positive psyllids. And then it tells you that the red ring shows orchards that are within a mile of a find and the yellow ring within one to five miles. So in this case, I put it on a commercial orchard and um, they're within one to five miles. And so it's a quick way for you to find out how close you are to the situation. So what happens when you get closer and closer to an HLB find? Well, obviously you're gonna in need to intensify the types and numbers of treatments for Asian citrus psyllid. You need to think about installing, if you haven't already, those barriers or putting repellents on the trees. You need to increase your surveillance for HLB. The sill is like the edges. Go check the edges for odd looking foliage. Uh, comply with treatments and tree removal of HLB trees that are happening in your area. So those are things that you can be doing. What about early detection techniques? We have at least six different uh, groups trying to develop techniques that could find trees that have only recently been infected. Those trees that just have 
one leaf or one branch that is affected. Um, and a lot of these techniques work really well. They're, they're measuring the metabolism of sick trees or the proteins produced by the tree or the bacteria in response to the disease or the microbes living on them or the volatile organic compounds released by them. And all these things are throughout the tree and so it, it doesn't require picking the right leaf. Um, the only one that's really available at any level because most of these require plant material to go to a laboratory or they can only they can only sample they can only test x number of trees per per week you know it's a small number of trees because it's very expensive to do these kinds of techniques um, the only one that's really available and reasonably priced i would say is are the canines. They can detect bacteria and alert and sit by individual trees. Um, we did not put the, these into the voluntary grower response plan yet because they're not readily avail available. So you should be watching for updates. But the, the canine thing has been really interesting. Uh, there is one company, F1 Canine, that is contracting with growers in the Ventura area to do some perimeter uh, checking of trees to see how far and wide the bacteria might be in that region. To date, they haven't found any PCR positive trees, so any alerts by dogs are really just indicating that the bacteria is there, but it hasn't necessarily caused disease in any trees. So the other thing you can be doing is walking your block twice a year and looking for symptoms and you could potentially pay a laboratory to test leaves. Um, the formerly the Citrus Tristeza Agency in Tulare County can receive samples and for a fee will will do testing and they are the only non-regulatory lab available at the moment. So that would be the place to go if you wanted to get some testing done on your orchard. What about bactericides? We have uh, section 18s and some full registration of two bactericides, streptomycin and oxytetracycline, firewall and fireline. We did not put those into the voluntary grower response plan because we don't really know how effectively they will prevent HLB infections. These bactericides break down really fast, so they have to be applied frequently. They might help prevent the psyllid from introducing the bacteria into a citrus leaf but we don't know enough about them to know how well to recommend them. Although if I were a grower in the Riverside area and within five miles of an infected tree, I would be considering them because anything that helps protect the edge of my orchard would be helpful and so they could be used as a perimeter spray. So those are available. Uh, I want to quickly address bulk citrus movement. Uh, you, most of you who are shipping citrus know that to go between zones you have to do some kind of mitigation so that we're not transferring fruit with psyllids on it between areas of the state. Uh, two mitigations are required if you're shipping out of zone six where the HLB has been found. Up to re very recently your choices were spray the orchard with a pesticide just prior to harvest or mechanically clean or wash the fruit after harvest before you move it, or use this evergreen pressurized spray system that Spencer Walsh developed. Um, the evergreen has never really been adopted because it's kind of complicated to use. You've got to have these tents, you've got to have fans set up just right, you've got to basically blow this spray through the bins and it's just not an easy process. So one of the things that Spencer and several others have been working on is developing uh, fumigation with ethyl formate gas and we're really hoping that it will get registered by the end of 2020. And it's amazing because you can basically throw a tar tarp over stacks of bins of fruit and you with one hour exposure of the fumigant which works its way really well through all the bins um, it will kill the psyllids. And so that could end up being the, the, the fast way to get shipments fumigated so fruit can move more freely around the state. I don't have time to go into this, but scientists are studying every conceivable way to stop this disease. And if you're interested in learning more about some of the methods, go to our Science for Citrus Health website and do some reading. We've developed some one, page, one to two page 
uh, descriptions of all the various, not all, but a lot of the methods that are being used to combat the disease and that's the place to go to, to study up on that. So I'll just finish with, um, there are things that you're going to be required to do. There are things that you should voluntarily do. I think you need to take HLB and the Asian citrus psyllid very, very seriously. It's the worst disease in the world in for citrus. Um, more optimistic than I used to be about our ability to prevent it from spreading. We seem to be doing a fairly good job in Southern California with the disease. We seem to be doing a very good job with the psyllid in the San Joaquin Valley in the desert areas. And I think everyone needs to just um, keep active, keep working, uh, keep fighting the good fight because you don't want to have to live with this disease. We want to postpone that as long as possible. So everything you're doing now is, is simply buying time for some of these solutions to the HLB problem to come about, to come for, to fruition so that we can eventually stop spraying for the psyllid. That would be ideal. And it may end up being this concept of stacking that there's no perfect resistant plant but there's a tolerant one and in combination with a couple of these other things like barriers and repellents and some insecticidal control we may get the whole thing under control so that we can keep a fresh fruit market industry here in California and not go the way of Florida who has lost 50 percent of their production and is really struggling to keep their juice plants rolling. So I think that's it. Um, I'll let Peter bring up the questions. So the first question is, what organism causes Huang Lung Bing? Is it a bacterium, a virus, or a fungus? All right, and the results should be up there. 94% of you are correct. It's a bacteria. Okay, next question. Okay. So. Okay, that should be up there. Which of these three chemicals has the longest residual effect on Asian citrus psyllid? Pyganic, Actara, or Delegate? The longest residual effect. 80% of you are correct. Actara is very long lasting. It's one, hands down one of the best chemicals. Pyganic is a pyrethrin, which is a botanical, and it has a very short life. It's not a pyrethroid, which would be a synthetic. Next one. Okay. Which county has Huang Lung Bing not been found in yet? Riverside, San Bernardino, Orange, Ventura, or Los Angeles? Okay, 55% of you are correct. It's Ventura is the correct answer. Um, the disease has definitely been found in trees in Riverside, San Bernardino, Orange, and Los Angeles residential trees, but trees nonetheless. Next question. What part of the citrus tree uh, does the do the psyllid nymphs grow on? The roots, the trunk, the branches, the leaf flush, or the fruit? What part of the citrus tree do psyllid nymphs grow on? 94% of you are correct. Leaf flush. Look at leaves. That's where they are. Next. What is the distance around a Huang Lang Bing find that CDFA responds with sampling and testing? I don't know that I emphasize this very much, but let's go for it anyway. 50 meters, 400 meters, or five miles? What's the distance around an HLB find, say they find a positive tree, that CDFA responds with sampling and testing? 57% of you are correct. The five miles, they're not sampling and testing. They're, they're throwing up a quarantine and they're managing bulk citrus and plant, plants in retail stores. 400 meters is, is what they're using to, as the limit of which they would go and collect leaf samples and test them for HLB. Next slide. What fumigant will eventually replace spray and move treatments for disinfesting bulk citrus? Ethyl formate, phosphine, methyl bromide, propylene oxide. 77% of you are correct. Ethyl formate is the compound that 
we're working, we're trying to get propylene oxide and phosphine as well, but they, they're harder to use. I, I really think ethyl formate is going to be the, the fumigant of choice. Next slide. Approximately how many HLB infected trees have been removed from residences in Southern California? 800, 1600, or 2500? Okay, 49% of you are correct. There's 698 as of last week. There's probably a few more now. Um, so the correct answer is 1600. Next slide. Which stage of the insect, the psyllid, is most important to focus on for sampling and control? The eggs, the nymphs, or the adults? Okay. 94% of you are correct. Focus on those nymphs. They're the ones picking up the disease. They're the ones you got to get control over. Okay. So next we're going to okay. do some questions. Yes, sir. Uh, we do have a few questions that have come in. So, um, um, so the first question is, can growers be compelled to treat for ACP in areas where populations are increasing? It's all a voluntary program. So I'm not sure what you mean by compelled. There, there's no regulation or it's, it's all peer pressure. It's basically your own need to get the population under control to protect your own citrus. And so, no, they cannot be compelled. If there is an HLB find near, in or near an orchard, yes, then you are compelled to treat. Okay, uh, we have another question. In transporting fruit, you may have some leaves on the transport. Do you know how long the bacteria will survive on the leaves? It's in the leaves and it doesn't survive once those leaves dry out. So when we're moving bulk citrus around, we're not worried about leaves as much as we are the psyllids that might be on those leaves because they could live for days and they could maybe move the disease. So that's why we, the state instituted, actually the industry self-instituted, uh, 100% tarping of loads so that those leaves wouldn't be flying out on the highways. And since we instituted that tarping, there have been fewer fines along the highways. So we know that's helping. So we don't worry so much about the disease in detached leaves. The only way the disease can move around is through a psyllid or by grafting. What we worry about is the psyllids. And this one was just a follow-up to that one. So those leaves will be attractive to the ACP or not for the dispersal of HLB? Those leaves might have, you know, there might be nymphs on the leaves or on the stems or even adults. I wouldn't say they would attract more insects to them because once the leaf starts to dry out, it's not very interesting to the insect. The insect's gonna wanna leave it actually. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay, uh, the next one, how accurate are the dogs in identifying CLAS in trees? True positives and false positives? That's a really good question. It's, it's, and it's difficult to answer because uh, it, we, how do you prove a dog is right? I mean, they've done lots of experiments in Florida where they set up uh, infected trees and control trees and the dogs are like 98% accurate in picking out which one is which. But in California, how do you prove that they're accurate here when you can't PCR the entire tree to figure out what they found and prove that they're, you, you can't confirm their accuracy very easily. So you have to kind of go with, they've been trained in Florida, they know what HLB is. If they sit next to a tree, they must be detecting the bacteria. And you just have to have trust in that. Okay, here's another question um, regarding dogs. If a dog sits on a tree, is the tree tented, tested, and observed over time? Uh, yes and no. If it's in an experimental situation, yes. If it's not, for example, the growers in Ventura, when they hired the dogs to come through this last time, they did not, they, they all agreed to re immediately remove trees. And so they just got rid of the trees. Um, the problem with tenting and observing over time, it might take 
years for the disease to develop, or it might never develop, because say the infection's in this one leaf and the dog detected it, and that leaf falls off of the tree, uh, you no longer have, the tree is in disease. It never went systemic. So it's just, that's a, that's a tough one. It's, it's really tough. Um, here's one comment uh, regarding the zero HLB in Ventura. The dogs found several trees this fall. Yes. Uh, they, f they alerted next to trees, which indicates the presence of the bacteria. It doesn't mean that the trees are diseased or that the bacteria has gone systemic. So we don't call them HLB infected trees. We just say they've been alerted on. And um, that's as far as we go with that. Okay, um, the next one, does legal pesticide residue level confuse border treatment strategy and how should that be managed by the grower? That is a tough one because growers have to report every pesticide applied and they're limited in the number of pesticides or the number of treatments of each pesticide they can make. There's a, a legal limit of pounds per acre. So yeah, say you treat uh, the, your border of your orchard with, I don't know, I'll pick a chemical, Danitol, and you've already hit the legal limit for that edge, you can't spray it again for other purposes. You can't, just because you're only spraying part of the orchard doesn't mean you can spray it over and over again. So growers are just gonna have to, when they're doing perimeter treatments, shift between different chemicals each time until we resolve that. And I don't know how we resolve it. Um, I don't know if we ever can. Okay, um, on an individual leaf flush, not the whole tree, what is the minimum time between HLB exposure and detection by the most sensitive method available, pest testing method available? Uh, I don't know the answer to their question, and I think that's one of the things that every researcher is trying to figure out. Like, is it weeks? Is it months? We don't know. Okay, um, and right now this one will be the last one, unless anybody has any additional. Um, citrus juice plants are located in the Central California Valley. Are we not transporting ACP from Southern California via the trucks and fruit? Um, eight to nine years ago, the largest population of trapped ACP was near the juice plants. Is the value of the juice worth the risk to the fresh fruit industry? Well, I think the 100% tarping is helping. It's it's preventing them from flying out on the road along the way. And any fruit that's coming from Southern California into the San Joaquin Valley, the orchard has to be treated or the fruit has to be mechanically disinfested of leaves and twigs and psyllids. So I think those protections have come into place and that's helping tremendously to minimize that risk. But there is always the risk, you know, that a that you don't kill all the psyllids, the fruit gets put into the truck, the truck drives to the juice plant, it untarps the, the truck and psyllids could potentially come out. Uh, I think again, the ethyl formate gas is going to hugely reduce that risk. And so we just need to keep pushing to, to get that registered. Okay, I don't see any other open questions. We will leave this um, survey open for a, a little while, but um, Beth, thank you for presenting today. And we do wanna thank everybody for attending. You're welcome, it was my pleasure.